Welcome back, everyone, to part three of our look at part one of Historis Civilis' series on the Congress of Vienna. This will be the last part of their first part of this video, and then we will start diving into part two, which will talk about the actual events that unfolded at the Congress of Vienna. This whole first part has been all about the background, really important, really necessary, and really top-notch information that they've been presenting here. I would imagine we're about to dive into Prussia. It's the only nation we really haven't looked at yet, so I'm excited to do that. If you have not seen the first two parts of my reaction, there's a link in the description that'll take you back to the beginning from a few days ago. Let's pick up right where we left off. In that same book, Zeman provides the best summary of Metternich's worldview that I've ever seen. In Metternich's case, coming to terms with the war meant considering the suffering he had witnessed endless times on the battlefields and along the roads. Unnecessary, pointless, even a crime caused by human delusions of grandeur that, he thought, could pull down the walls protecting civilization and the law as he understood it, at any time and in any place. It was the duty of politics to erect enduring barriers against this possibility. So it's pretty fascinating. Uh, we're still picking up on the end of Austria. I stopped a little bit too early, it appears, but that's okay. Uh, this is a great view into the mindset of the Austrian representative in all of this, that he sees it as their duty as politicians to put up barriers to basically unrestricted uh, wars of conquest. And of course, isn't it interesting then that one of the greatest wars in human history is going to unfold because of the Austrian aggression against Serbia. So kind of fascinating stuff when you look ahead, when you know what's coming. He opposed this catastrophe on humanitarian grounds, and his lasting commitment was never again. He would have been horrified Metternich by saw World balance War. between great powers as the answer. He feared a second French Revolution, or something like it, but he couldn't clearly see how Austria could possibly prevent one. However, with a balanced international system, any state seeking to dominate could simply be slapped down by everybody else. Again, this is kind of a forward-thinking idea that looks ahead 100 years to the ideas of the League of Nations and then the United Nations, that the international community is going to band together to keep people in check when they decide to do these kinds of things like France had just done for the last 20 years. This theory for peace played into Austrian strengths. Ever since the French Revolution, Austria had positioned itself as the defender of precedent and tradition and the rule of law. Accordingly, they began to expand their diplomatic influence and cultivate a following of smaller states, especially in Central Europe who feared being swallowed up by the regional instability that would inevitably follow the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. Before proceeding, it would be helpful to discuss what the Austrian Empire actually was. What we're really talking about here is the personal holdings of the Habsburg family, which included the lands that had been the Duchy of Austria, so it's important that he points that out, that these are personal holdings, because we're still in kind of this part of history where the idea of a modern nation state as we know it today is still relatively new. Uh, you know, the United States is, of course, a country at this point, uh, and there are some other examples, but you still have places like this where it's about what territory is controlled or ruled by people rather than a nation. Uh, so Austria-Hungary is this kind of, well, it's Austria right now, is this kind of collection of territories ruled by a family. It's not really a nation in the modern sense. But it also included the Kingdom of Hungary, the Kingdom of Bohemia, the Kingdom of Croatia, along with a hodgepodge of other titles. 
it may be helpful to look at the ethnic breakdown of mm. the Austrian Empire, because this will tell you everything you need to know about Austrian politics. First and foremost, there was the German-speaking core, centered around Vienna and the old Duchy of Austria. And this is, I mean, by and large, this is what modern Austria is today. It's a little more than that, but modern Austria is basically the northern half of what you're looking at here. Then there were the Magyars of Hungary, who spoke Hungarian. The third major group were the Bohemians, who spoke Czech. Then in the borderlands, there were Croats, Serbs, Slovaks, and others who spoke various Slavic languages. To the east, there was Transylvania, whose inhabitants spoke Romanian. There were also regions where the majority spoke Polish and Ukrainian. And although this wasn't the case at this exact moment, the Austrian Empire would soon have a large Italian minority as well. By one count, the Austrian Empire consisted of 14 ethnic groups mm. speaking 17 different languages. So you can see the issues you would have in holding something like that together. You've not only got multiple ethnic groups, multiple languages, you're also in some cases dealing with multiple religions. You've got Eastern Orthodox, you've got Catholic, you've probably got some Muslims in the South. Uh, it, it's, it's tough to hold together for very long once you start getting away from a feudal system and you get more toward the idea of nationalities. The Austrian Empire was really an incredible experiment, one that you don't see anywhere else in the 19th century. This was not the case of one ethnic group dominating their neighbors. This was a true synthesis of cultures and ethnicities united under the Habsburg Emperor. In the eyes of the Habsburg Emperor, all of these holdings were at least theoretically co-equal, which made administering the empire mm. the world's most complicated balancing act. The constraints within the Habsburg system become clear when you look at the crown's relationship with the Kingdom of Hungary. The Kingdom of Hungary was home to more than just the ethnic Hungarian population, and when you add everybody together, it accounted for 35-40% to 40 of the Austrian Empire's total population. That fact alone should make it clear why there was tension between the Austrian Germans and the Hungarians. Yep. The Habsburg Emperor ruled Hungary as their king, but he was not one of them, and so he was bound by severe constitutional limitations. One of these limitations was that the Hungarian king was not allowed to tax the people of Hungary. The local Hungarian aristocracy was allowed to tax the people, but they were under no obligation to pass that money along to their king. Again, this is 35-40% to 40 of the empire's population we're talking about. This exemption created a massive hole in the imperial budget mm. that Austria was constantly trying to fill. And so once again, I just have to you know, point out here that why does all this matter, right? Why does internal politics in the Austrian Empire and the, facts that th the fact that they can't tax people within the Kingdom of Hungary matter at all when we're talking about the Congress of Vienna? Well, it matters because, once again, we are dealing with major powers coming together to decide the fate of Europe, who all come in with their own issues, their own baggage, their own agenda, their own uh, fights that they're dealing with back home that then they carry into this relationship with these other nations. And so all of it matters. And uh, again, you know, I've never really seen a look at these events take this perspective, and I really, really appreciate that they're doing it this way. Over the centuries, this arrangement resulted in the Hungarian aristocracy becoming extremely rich, even though the Hungarian people remained quite poor compared to the German-speaking population to the west. The Hungarian king was also constrained when it came to military recruitment. Despite being home to 35-40% to 40 of the Austrian Empire, Hungarian subjects only made up like 5% of its military. This number could fluctuate. During the Napoleonic Wars, it climbed as high as 20%. But in order to accomplish that, the Habsburg Emperor had to go to the Hungarian aristocracy and give them whatever they wanted. This tenuous constitutional relationship meant that Austria was cursed in a way to be in constant negotiations with itself. The Hungarians were always suspicious of any territorial gains that added more ethnic Germans to the empire. 
Right, because that means they're less of an influence and they're less of a factor. And this is important stuff, too, as you think ahead to things like World War One, because uh, a lot of people wonder, why was Austria-Hungary so weak compared to Germany when it came to fighting in World War One? And this is a big part of it, is that Germany was very much united compared to Austria-Hungary. Did they have their issues? Did they have their factions within the states that made up the German Empire? Absolutely they did. But nowhere near to the same degree or in the same way that the Austro-Hungarians did. The whole political system was a delicate balance. And if the ethnic Germans got something, the Hungarians always wanted something too. Despite all of its contradictions, the Austrian Empire had a lot of credibility on the international stage. Whatever the reasons, the fact that Austria was not primarily concerned with territorial expansion mattered a lot, especially to all of those tiny Central European states who had recently been made vulnerable by the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. It meant that despite having the weakest military of the great powers, Austria had a lot of friends at a time when having a lot of friends was a valuable thing to have. None of this was true of the other German great power. In many ways, Austria's the mirror opposite. opposite. Where Austria was old, they were young. Where Austria was defined by their diversity, they were defined by their Germanness. Where Austria was weaker militarily than they could be, they were stronger militarily than they ought to be. So why does Prussia kind of all of a sudden come on the stage about this time? Well, I mean, they had been around you know, before this, but uh, in the vacuum created by the elimination of the, um, the Holy Roman Empire, somebody was going to step into that power vacuum out of all of these German states that had once made up that empire. And this was the opportunity for Prussia to step up and be that power. They already have the, the kind of infrastructure for it with a, uh, a strong military and a very professional military force. Where Austria was not that interested in territorial expansion, they were obsessed with it to the point where they thought of very little else. The two German great powers were brothers, but they were brothers that did not get along. In 1814, the thing that defined Prussia was its precarity. It was the smallest of the great powers in every way. It had a tiny population of 10 million people, three times less populous than France, and almost five times less populous than Russia. It was also small geographically. As you can see, its tiny population was crammed into a bunch of isolated pockets that weren't even connected to each other. It was also precarious in its positioning. As I've already discussed, Central Europe was no longer under the protection of the Holy Roman Empire. So again, why? how does a, a nation like Prussia end up with all of these disconnected pieces like that? Well, again, it has to do with the fact that these are states that are born out of personal holdings rather than out of a you know like a state that develops and so when you have the king of prussia holding these lands they kind of become a part of your realm which meant that tiny prussia was now vulnerable to its much larger neighbors vulnerable might be underselling it the prussians had enlisted russian help against the french but now there were russians everywhere Poland was under joint Russian and Prussian occupation, but there were also Russians occupying the Polish-speaking areas of Eastern Prussia, and they weren't leaving. The Russians were also occupying Saxony along Prussia's southern border, and these guys weren't leaving either. Central Europe was in a state of flux. It was clear to everybody that Russia saw opportunity here, which was entirely antithetical to the balance of power principle. The other great powers would have no choice but to respond. In the eyes of people like Metternich and Castlereagh, Russia had to remove itself from Central Europe if there was ever to be peace. Prussia had to become the kind of great power that was capable of resisting Russian influence. Be careful what you wish for. How many times in history have we seen the empowering of a group of people 
to accomplish some agenda only to have that group that you empower then become your enemy, right? Here we have the UK and the Austrians basically looking at Prussia and saying, we need a strong Prussia in order for there to be peace in Europe. And then Austria and another generation or two is going to be at war with uh, Prussia. And then, of course, the UK is going to be at war with the Prussians uh, in the form of Germany. That was the priority of the Prussian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, Karl August von Hardenberg. The experience with Napoleon had taught Hardenberg that Prussia was not yet a true great power. It was powerful regionally, but it was too small to have a global impact. In order to graduate from a regional power to a great power, Prussia needed people, Prussia needed resources, and Prussia needed territory. This line between a strong regional power and a weak great power is a fuzzy one. Eric Hobsbawm writes that, quote, Austria and Prussia were really great powers by courtesy mm. only. Continuing later, their chief function was to act as European stabilizers. It's true that Austria and Prussia could not match the global influence of France, Britain, and Russia. But... What do they have going for them? Their location. They are the buffer between Russia, France, and the UK. Uh, and so they automatically get importance for that reason alone. Uh, and you can see how with Prussia having those aims of needing more people, more territory, those things like that, how it's a natural view to want to try and start uniting all of these smaller German states into one powerful whole because they can see the benefit of a united Germany and it's going to take someone like Bismarck to come along to make that happen. I would quibble slightly and say that Austria's diplomatic influence at this time made them a great power, but it's true that That's Prussia fair. lacked the global reach of any of the other powers. The only reason everybody decided to treat them as a great power was their formidable military. By the end of the war, on a per capita basis, Prussia was fielding six times more soldiers than Austria, which meant that despite their relative weakness, they were capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other great power. Hardenberg saw in Prussia an urgent need for territorial expansion. All of these isolated enclaves would not do. They were just asking to be swallowed up by some stronger power. Yep. In the upcoming peace conference, Prussia hoped to gain some territorial coherence and become a true great power with global influence. The original plan was for the four victorious great powers, Britain, Russia, Austria, and Prussia, to dominate the peace conference and impose their will upon everyone else. What could possibly go wrong if you do that, right? But Tsar Alexander's behavior had begun to make people nervous, and Russia's creeping domination over Prussia seemed a disaster waiting to happen. If there was a serious split at the conference, with Britain and Austria on one side and Russia and Prussia on the other, it was difficult to imagine how they could possibly resolve it without descending into another war. Metternich and Castlereagh saw this looming crisis before them, and so they approached Talleyrand and asked him to represent France at Vienna. Hmm. France remained a great power, and so it made very little sense to exclude them from shaping the post-war world. Like we said back at the beginning, you have to remember, France has not been annihilated like, say, a Germany at the end of World War II, where Germany required the Allies' help to rebuild and really was obliterated as a world power. France is still strong. Um, you know, they've still got a lot going for them. They've still got a huge population. They've lost a lot militarily, but so have these other nations too. So they can't just dominate France the way you might see in other wars. Besides, Napoleon Bonaparte had been defeated and removed from power, which meant that France was theoretically a normal country again. Naturally, nothing could have pleased Talleyrand more. 
Castlereagh and Metternich pulled in Hardenberg of Prussia, who was still keen on finding a way to resist Russian influence, and got him to agree. This left Tsar Alexander mm. isolated when the four other great powers came to him and demanded that France be given a seat at the Congress. He, of course, threw a fit, but then what reluctantly choice do you agreed. Have? Over the summer, everybody traveled to Vienna. And by everybody, I mean everybody. Virtually every state in Europe sent delegations. And some states that didn't even exist anymore sent delegations as well. After decades of war, a festive, slightly euphoric mood took over the city. Peace was at hand. Hmm. When September rolled around, the real work began. All right, so and it's fascinating when you think about the fact that we're just months away from Napoleon coming back and once again leading an army and us having to face the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, but we're not there yet. So uh, there we are. We have finished up part one. We're going to dive into the Congress of Vienna itself uh, later on this week, so I'm excited to dive into that. Uh, I am off to Cleveland tonight. I'm speaking at a school tomorrow. Uh, so I'm excited for that as well. So we will see you again very soon. Please hit that like button if you would. And we will see you next time with part one of part two. Keeping it straight as best I can. Thanks for watching.